Welcome to Insights from Vessel Tracking Data, a workshop on analyzing and visualizing maritime activity at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. I would like to acknowledge that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. Our session will start with a welcome and a project overview from Ronald Pilot. It will then be followed by an AIS and machine learning overview by Gabriel Spaden. You will then learn about Matthew Smith's tool, AISDB. And then hear from Claudio Di Bacco on AIS objectives from the DFO perspective. First, I would like to introduce Ronald Pilot to you. Dr. Ronald Pilot is a professor of industrial engineering at Dalhousie University. He has devoted years to creating cutting edge software and analysis techniques that enhance coastal security, manage spills and boost maritime safety. Dr. Pilot's methods include risk analysis, traffic modeling, data processing, pattern analysis and safety assessments. The AS data is, uh, is, as I said, for safety originally, uh, but it's been used by hundreds, thousands of people, uh, researchers, I mean, aside from, uh, uh, you know, industry people and, and government using it for operations. And you could say that it's been used for environmental reasons, which is a big interest to many people in this workshop today, whether it's uh, where the ship's going so we can track ballast water, we can predict it for the future, and what about whale strikes with whales? And uh, what about going through marine protected areas? And you can list, uh, you know, I don't know, at least 10, 20 kind of common air emissions from ships. Lots of researchers doing all kinds of environmental <laughs> impacts and uh, thinking about the ships themselves, like traffic management and avoiding uh, interference with other activities and stuff like that. Uh, so the issue is that uh, it's a very tricky uh, data to work with in a way, and that's what uh, uh, Gabriel and uh, Matt are mostly going to talk about in the intro, um, because it's a bit messy, so it needs cleaning up like most databases. Um, there needs all kinds of different formatting and processing for different uses. And, uh, and also, uh, even if you have that, then of course, it's very good to bring AI machine learning into it to look for patterns that you don't know <laughs> you're looking for initially, trying to find out what's there. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, to that end, um, DFO had a contribution uh, 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 program uh, for uh, funding different kinds of projects. And uh, Stan Matlin's lab, including his Meridian group and uh, several people that I work with from my uh, projects in industrial engineering put in an application last summer and we were successful. So it's a three year uh, project starting now. And, uh, and uh, some was sent out to you in the preliminary information anyways. Uh, but here briefly, because I'm not going to read all of these, are the aims of the project. Uh, the aims of the project are to develop a more publicly available, at least to DFO and the government, but presumably more publicly available than that, a set of tools that are more user friendly. So usually when I want to do research on these things, you know, I talk to Stan's lab and they take their existing scripts and modify them and make them work for what I need. Well, they can't do that for all the users out there. Uh, and they do that a lot in the Meridian project and other projects as well. So we need something that is more uh, user friendly and readily available. And that also comes with things like how you're going to improve um, the data uh, cleaning, how you're going to improve the possible tools that are in there, as I said, from the AI and other types of approaches to it, and also capacity building in a way, have uh, involved uh, coastal community groups as well as government reps, as well as teaching it to schools, uh, to school children or presentations uh, for younger generation, all that is part of this project, so we can engage a lot of people to find out what their needs are, to see if you can respond to the most needs possible, and um, and also start the younger people so that, of course, they can uh, get into this uh, later on. Um, so the purpose of today's uh, workshop is that uh, this is our preliminary consult this consultation when we prepared the grant, and we've been talking to DFO, of course, but this is a more formal way to get more people together and say, how have you already been using it? 
or how would you like to use it, or let's generate some ideas for brainstorming of, of things we might like to add to this. So it's to give you an overview of the project and um, and this uh, tools that have already been developed in Stan Matlin's lab, notably the AISDB, uh, is the foundation that they're going to build on. You can start today and in three years do what I just said. It's impossible. But they already have a foundation and a lot of experience and already how to use this data and to do all kinds of things already. Now it's got to be streamlined and improved. So the purpose of the workshop is to discuss how that might be done with a whole bunch of little presentations and then time for a discussion afterwards. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, thank you very much. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Gabriel who will start to get a little bit more into the technical side of things. Thank you, Ron. Yeah. So Gabriel Spaden is a postdoctoral fellow at Dalhousie University with experience in neural inspired models, graph based deep learning and complex network dynamics. He researches machine learning, deep learning, time series and data mining applied to interdisciplinary studies. Ranging from suburban mobility and human migrations to vessel mobility and trajectory forecasting. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone online. So I will be talking a little bit about machine learning, but I don't get into the specifics of what we can do with machine learning because other speakers will be talking about this during our sessions. But here I will talk about some limitations that we can, that we can observe from these models. And to start this discussion, let's start from something a little bit more visual, so these images. And you see these images and say, okay, what that has to do with AIS? And I say everything, because they were AI generated. All these images came from a machine. And when I created these images through an AI model, so these are many models cooperating together, I asked these models to put a ship in the ocean in a cloudy sky and focus on the AIS antenna of this ship. And you can see here that we have a very nice images that could serve as your background, but it's just that. We don't see anything that resembles us AIS unless the image of the ship. And actually, we are living this moment of AI where we have many models, very generic, such as chat, GPT, GPT-4, and others that can do these impressive things. But if we don't narrow them down to what we actually want them to do, they are not that useful for us. They can just create some images, but that's it. But what AIS has that is different from the other data, and that is mobility. So AIS is a it's very important in, the, in terms of deep learning, because that allows us to look the past and forecast the future, or look different types of move, movement patterns that arise from the same track or a similar uh, group of tracks from different vessels. And this mobility is not something that is tied to vessels, such as the Strait of Juan de Fuca in your left, or in case of urban mobility on your right. Okay, so mobility by itself, it's in our daily lives, can be from ourselves, can be from boats, and the patterns that arise from this mobility, it's what allow us to answer different questions, such as identify uh, spoofing activity from the sea, using information from uh, trajectories to understand how that affects the noise and the wildlife in the ocean. So all those can be answered through machine learning. And an example for that of that is how we can use this sequential data to understand the different patterns of the data. So the AIS data give us latitude, lat longitude, course, and speed. So given this geometrical nature of the sequence uh, of the sequential data, we can understand what comes before to say what will happen after. And in this paper specifically that the different trajectories of fishing vessels in the Strait of Juan de Fuca using um, only the geometry of the tracks to identify when a vessel would make a turn. And these turns related to fishing vessels 
are potentially related to the vessels engaging in actually fishing activity. So this was done using AIS data, but can we do more? And that's, that's actually always the question because these models, they work for a simple region, a single region, just a straight off one, the FUCA, or just, or a But what if we go back in the beginning where I generate the images and make a different question now? You, the model does not know we, what AIS is, but an AIS antenna is something a little bit more simple. If we remove the vessel from the, from the equation and ask the model, okay, give me an AIS antenna sitting by the ocean with a cloudy sky and a, a nice view. Then look funny, some of them power grids, but none of them look an AIS on a VHF antenna. And that's actually to show that we need to be very specific in what we want. And if we want to accomplish these big things, we have we need more data. And an example of that in terms of AIS is this problem here, where instead of using just one sequence of one vessel type, which is a fishing vessel. We train this model with most uh, all the data that we have. Different vessel types, leisure vessels, cargo vessels, fishing vessels, uh, and see how these different models will react based on their mobility patterns. And as we can see from, from the images uh, that we generated the antennas, the same can be observed in terms of the tracks, because we have some very specific patterns of fishing vessels that sometimes are just considering cargo vessels, depending on how much you show to the model that uh, you show the model the preview, the, the best of the track to achieve uh, your forecasting. So the idea of mentioning all of this is so we understand that machine learning is a tool that can actually be used for good things. And we actually can use it to uh, to forecast tracks, to AIS spoofing, to understand a little bit of, about uh, what is happening uh, under the sea. But for that, data is important. And having this data prepared, curated, and correctly used is the, not only the most important part, but it's also a primary part you have with your partners that are working with you and helping this model should be built. So this is the image. Uh, last image from the, the paper from fishing detection that I mentioned, uh, where we show and discuss in this paper that the only way that we can move forward with better models that can give us more accurate results is if we include experts in the middle of the process. So this is why this workshop is happening and we are looking all forward to hear from you later on how we can move this forward. So I leave the floor to Matt to explain a little bit about AISDB. Yeah, Matthew Smith is a graduate of Dalhousie University with a Bachelor in Applied Computer Science. He has extensive experience in managing and analyzing automatic identi identification system or AIS data, currently working towards facilitating research efforts across Canada by providing access to AIS data. Thank you. So, uh, Gabriel and Ron gave a bit of an overview about AIS itself. So, now I'm going to discuss the software that we're building at Meridian for working with AIS. So vessel tracking with AIS TV. A uh, bit of an overview about this project. Uh, the project goal is to be a complete suite of software tools for working with AIS. So, this includes inputting data for both historical or live stream AIS messages, storing it in a database, some processing functions in Python for data cleaning and trajectory model, uh, some visualization tools so you can view the data on a map, and then exporting the data to CSV. So this project is primarily available via Python interface and is compatible with the Postgres or SQLite database platforms. 
and has a web interface for visualizations. The database incorporates a few data sources, so uh, takes in either terrestrial or satellite historical data files or live streaming AIS feeds, and it also incorporates some metadata sources from the internet. So it pulls marine traffic metadata, as well as bathymetric data at a short distance or other raster data formats. And in the data, it would store uh, AIS message fields, including the ship identity, the MMSI number, the ship type, uh, position, speed, course, etc. So once it's in the database, it could be uh, queried, depending on the time and region you're interested in, uh, used for post-processing, and then exported and overlaid on the map. Some of the functions in the Python package are um, some of these include data reduction, has tools for interpolation, uh, noise removal, and data cleaning, uh, integration with the public data sources, uh, geofencing and geomasking on the data, and for computing a graph model of vessel movements, as well as some others. For example, uh, to visualize the data, uh, this is still an experimental feature, but uh, creating heat maps. So this example is one month of data on the west coast of the Pacific for July 2021. And to create the heat map, the tracks are first interpolated to a uniform frequency. So you can see uh, most of the traffic is concentrated around coastlines, and there's two kind of main uh, shipping lanes that are that vessel. Another feature that um, we're using in AISDB is noise removal. Noise removal is very important because AI data tends to be very noisy due to signal loss, and this causes message corruption as well as other errors. And another issue is that the vessel identification numbers are not necessarily unique. Sometimes there's multiple vessels broadcasting with the same MMSI number from different locations at the same time. So AISDB uses an encoder to clean this noisy data and deduplicate the MMSI numbers. Uh, this algorithm was developed in-house here at Meridian, and I'll try and give a brief overview of it, how it works. So first, the vessel tracks are vectorized as a time series, and then each delta is compared against the speed and a distance threshold. And then if it exceeds those thresholds, the tracks are segmented. Each segment is then compared for likelihood of membership in that vessel track using a score function. And then the highest scoring segment pairs are then concatenated back into that track. And ideally that noise would be not concatenated and separated out from the track. So here's an example of how it works. On the left is unprocessed AIS data. It's 24 hours of data from July 1st. So this is um, this is just normal data. It's only 24 hours of data, so there's not too much noise. You can see on the left hand there is one ship that looks like it's transiting over land, which is might be a noise, but otherwise there's not too much noise in this example. So just for the sake of the example, I've added in uh, more noise, more artificial noise, by replacing every second message with uh, random noise, essentially. And in the third image, you can see the results of running through the denoising encoder. And it cleans up pretty much all of the noise, as well as that original uh, vessel transiting over the land. One other feature we have here in AISDB is uh, graph models, and this really helps to understand the big picture of vessel movements and where they're coming from and where they're moving to. So here, uh, vessel activity is modeled by casting number of edges, which are these vessel tracks between the network nodes, which in this image you can see are the zone polygons. And then by aggregating the number of edges that intersect each node, you can gain uh, an understanding of 
first movement between each cell. So that's uh, all I have. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you're interested to learn more about the software, you can check out the repository as well as the documentation, and there's a link to our website there. Thank you. Yeah, so next, um, Ronnie, would you like to say a few words on, um, on the objectives from the book perspective? Yeah. yeah, so Claudia Hibakla is a research scientist with Fisheries and Ocean Canada at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography, along with colleagues uh, Kira Kronhansel, who is here as well, and Van Loan. He leads the DFO Maritimes Biofouling Monitoring Program, which focuses on monitoring the introduction, establishment, and uh, spread and impacts of non-indigenous species. In addition, they conduct basic and applied research to better understand biological, physical, and environmental factors that affect the spread of those species, including short-term interannual environmental variability and long-term climate change. Over the past three and more years, they have collaborated with the big data center, which is us. So Stan, that's <laughs> the BI and then Matt Smith and Oliver Kiesebaum, to explore the utility of natural biogeographic barriers and vessel traffic patterns as an innovative approach for managing the secondary spread of these species in nearshore Canadian coastal ecosystems. So I'm going to learn about this talk yesterday. That's right. We actually put a talk together, but I did put some notes together this morning. So first off, um, I just want to congratulate Sarah, Pat, Ron, and your team for successfully um, getting funding for species. We were one of the first ones funded and it was national, which is really impressive. It just goes to show the um, for how much people values what you propose, and at the same time, they're going to be keeping an eye on your progress. So no pressure. Congratulations, yeah, yeah. it was quite easy. Um, second, um, I guess from my perspective over the last six or seven years of using, um, I'm going to try not to use AIS when I'm talking about a plot based species. It's the other AIS in the room that we'll try to use um, non indigenous species. Over the last six, seven years, the frustration and the realization within the ecology. Like me, you don't have big data processing skills to use this information yet. Ron highlighted a lot of the uh, applications that actually use um, regularly. It's become quite central. Um, and we feel like, uh, at least working with your group the last couple of years, was uh, really eye opening. We learned a lot. What I recognize is that the info really needs to put some time and effort into um, sort of centralizing the effort. Uh, it is sort of distributed across regions and even across scientists within the region um, to centralize some of those high level processing and get people um, more productive and less time uh, dealing with these large data sets. So thanks for putting this together. And I think um, from a DFO perspective, it's going to be pretty useful. Um, I'm in the talk, uh, the second talk, I'm going to highlight some of the work that we've been doing with the big data center and some of the slides that Matt showed and you should all some time. But more from a science perspective, why it's important. People who are presenting their applications. I think it should come together pretty easily. From our perspective, though, really the application, the, the intent of this meeting is to sort of share with you the needs and, and limitations that we have so that we can um, work together to sort of fill those gaps so we can dig in for your, your plan. So within DFO, um, there seems to be a lot of duplicated effort in generating um, data sources. So people will download the same data sources. They go to the Canadian Coast Guard, or they go to some satellite uh, providing service, and they'll work independently in the process and try to clean that data. So then um, there's no active data repository for that. So if you generate that data, I can't go find it somewhere. Um, and I know that the bias is on the call, so maybe go chime in on this. Um, this is uh, and, and there's no actual support. To that. There's no support even to extract data products from even those clean databases that people want. So there's a lot of duplicated effort. There's a lot of lost productivity and higher cost in these things. So I think that's part of the reason why we saw the utility. Um, 
Again, I've outlined the info perspectives and needs um, five general categories. I'll just go over them quickly. It's not meant to be comprehensive. If I had had time, I would have consulted with different people who are on the call and others. Um, but I do encourage those people to speak up either stop me if you have a comment to make or at the end I'll chime in. So um, all the game will be included. So I'm going to talk a little bit about data sources, data processing, the tools and products. Kind of this is what our, our expectations or hopes are um, in terms of information transfer. So the tools that you're building, the data sets you're building, how we can sort of uh, bring those into the info and perhaps become self-sufficient. And then serving data up. Uh, I think Matt covered something and Vaughn covered something, but uh, we do have um, a, a broad clientele, so we do like to serve data. And I know a lot of this has been a form of licensing. Have our discussions today over there. And then um, I want to touch a little bit again on DFO roles and responsibilities because I think that we have uh, contributions to make as you go through this process. <laughs> you know, so I want I. I think I understand some of our roles and responsibilities, but I would like to hear from you and how we can better support. So data sources, um, this becomes an issue for us in the uh, image that that showed. Our project was focused on the east coast of Canada and into the high Arctic and the west coast of Canada, so again into the high Arctic. But there are people on top who will talk about uh, global transport, right? So most of this data we use to understand shipping patterns, but ultimately there's an application at the end, whether it's trying to uh, do a risk assessment, right? On route as well, we have our own risk assessments, whether it's introducing um, non native species to pristine habitats and trying to avoid that, or whether it's risk of introducing some deleterious species or chemicals, et cetera, to um, conservation areas. Um, we, our work, we focus on satellite data and we, uh, within DFO, that's served up by the Canadian Space Agency. We have global coverage, so there might be some uh, room there for data sharing. Um, but the scenarios and the people that I know who are working oftentimes, it's mostly Northern Hemisphere, but from that perspective, it's global. We don't focus on just Canadian. So that's important. Um, there's a discrepancy between satellite and terrestrial data. We're very inter interested in terrestrial. There were limitations in finding terrestrial data that were part of our domain. So we couldn't actually use terrestrial data in one of the current studies, which I'll talk about later. So that's an issue as well that we might need to get around. DFO has lots of VMS data. It's their own vessel monitoring system for fishing vessels. That's a challenge to get access to that data. If it has been done, we can talk about trying to do it. But it's a wealth of information. And if you can get it, you can really characterize fishing vessels and fishing activity like you were talking about. And then the one gap that we see that's very important to us in trying to understand risk is recreational boats. And I know there have been some projects that start to try to characterize recreational boats, um, but it's really kind of a black box um, where uh, I don't, haven't seen a tremendous amount of progress. And maybe this group mm -hmm. knows the work that's going on that I don't, but I'd love to hear about it. Certainly, maybe we can talk about where we can, how we can get that data. Maybe that's where um, AI machine learning. But that's a, a huge gap for the FO. Um, we really like to try to put that to the um, Data processing and tools. I think uh, Matt went over this uh, really well. I don't need to say much here, except um, we are interested in trying to adapt some of these pipelines um, and perhaps training for some people in house. Again, Tobias, I know, is on the call, so maybe you want to comment on this. I know he's working very hard to try to establish some sort of enterprise hub support uh, for long term that would allow us not only to store the data but, but perhaps to work the data update the data etc mm -hmm. and in a perfect world this would come back or we need to serve the data back to people including yourselves if you're if there's a gap i won't go into the types of data that we're really using i, I have to have that in my other talk so we'll get into that um, tools transfers this is something uh, that i will leave to uh, the bias comment on. Um, but at some level, we would like people to sort of take ownership mm -hmm. and to provide support in house and to our clients. Academics are part of our clients. We work extensively with them as our NGOs, um, First Nations, as well as the public. So one of our mandates now is to share um, all of our data 
um, how well we do that is question, but you'll find that even over the last five years, a lot of programs have made their data available online, even if it's not super easy. But we would like to, that's part of, that came out clear in your proposal, and we'd like to be able to help. But we're building a fairly sizable network within programs of whether it's a talking based of species or FDA, MCP, and spatial planning. Um, I just want to end by saying something about roles and responsibilities. So um, we do, within the we do uh, want to establish a centralized sort of data management serving uh, system. And we'd like to see our repositories for not only raw data, but also for clean data and for data products. The data products is a challenge, right? Because everybody that comes and talks to Matt about getting things useful for their um, for their project has slightly different needs. And it's broad alluded to this. It's been a big issue for us. It's one of the whole focus. But those first two, like repositories of raw data, clean data, and process data, should not be a challenge. Right? It's something that we can systematic when you're starting to take care of the factors. Um, so I'm really interested in the data visualization and the tool that you ended up talking about and moving forward. Um, I would say that with a focus on not just the heavy users, the most capable users, but people with really basic skills. If we can make that data available, and it was selectively natural and manual, so I can run the data from the manual, which is fortunate here, and they can work with that data, the data can be in a format, you'll have a lot more users in the right now. Understand what the process is between both and both data. I know we frustrated him a lot, but we learned a lot in the process. Uh, I want to give people a chance to talk. Maybe uh, Tobias wants to talk a little bit about his efforts on the enterprise data and how initiative. Um, but I do also, I guess there are several people who are talking, but if there are things I missed that should be highlighted now, I'll open the floor to the other people. Because there are some people on the call I know who've had a tremendous amount of experience for including this group. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Was there anyone from online who would like to share and add to this? Yeah, Tobias? <laughs> Hi everyone, um, Tobias Spears, uh, Office of the Chief Data Steward with DFO. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, so Claudio, uh, I think he did a great job of summarizing our, uh, our current state. So we know that AIS data is really critical to many of our operations in the department. Um, so we, and uh, historically that data has been acquired, processed, uh handled shared and used in quite disparate means so uh and I, I was quite interested when claudio had invited me to participate in the working group meetings with dalhousie um it was great to see uh the focused effort and the support that matt was providing to the team regionally and it really gave us an opportunity to explore even just some of the um the logistical challenges of getting access to some of the data that's involved um, as Claudio said, um, you know, the department has a mandate, um, you know, AIS really is a, is a, a, a broad reaching data resource. So uh, on our site, we do need to have a better way of managing it. And, uh, and in my discussions with Claudio, I, I really see that being at least the, uh, the back office management from an IT perspective being done centrally. And we have, uh, we have a number of folks from, um, uh, from the department here on the line, uh, Lee Croft and Riem El Habian are in my team, and have been involved in projects uh, using and uh, and licensing AIS data uh, from uh, companies like Exact Earth. Uh, I see that, uh, and I see that George Esper is also on the line. So it's actually George's team that is leading the implementation of our departmental enterprise data hub. So. Um, I think we are getting to the point where we now have at least we have a, a platform target that we can that we can point to. So I, I think that's great. Um, I think there's a lot more to do. We need a business model. So 
you know, in order for us to really do some of this work, um, you know, sustainably, uh, we need a funding model. We need to pay for licensing. We need to ensure that we've secured the uh, the cloud infrastructure. Uh, in terms of of actually handling the data and providing interoperable access to raw and processed, uh, I'm not too concerned about that because I do think that that will that will come in time because that's uh, that's directly in the purview of the work that'll be done with the Enterprise Data Hub team. Uh, so I have no concerns there. Um, I think it's great that you guys are looking to um, to expand the, the sophistication of your own processing capability and building value added product. Um, I don't think we I don't think we have a really good sense of what all of the use cases are in DFO, but definitely folks like Claudio are really instrumental and even this group because it gives us a, a better sense of who in the department is using the data. So, um, so ultimately, you know, even, I mean, even having a group like this bring communities together, um, you know, develop cleaning and quality control and processing pipelines, having some discussion on what kind of minimum viable products would be for different communities, uh, all of that would be of interest. And, uh, and definitely, uh, I think my, I think my counterparts here from the department will, uh, uh, may be able to contribute as well, but uh, but definitely looking forward to uh, to seeing the work that you're doing. Thank you. I think we have a we can open up this discussion for everyone now. Like so, it's a, we have about ten minutes for question and answers as well to the to the speakers. Do the speakers want to go to the front again? In case there are some questions for you. Yeah. Do we have any questions there from the audience online or in the room? Yeah. Um, actually, it's about the AAS, uh, your track reconstructions, actually. And I know you, it sounded like you did some experiments with different sources of like synthetic tracks and error. How robust is it to like um, large errors or heavy tail distribution in the errors or anything like that? Um, if it's completely random noise, it's quite robust. Uh, the, the case where it's not so good is if the noise is in a very close proximity or close time <laughs> to the real data. And it has a difficult time kind of discerning that. I also don't know if uh, people in Stan's lab have done uh, uh, work on comparing with GPS data, but people do that as well. Uh, you know, the GPS on the ship should be reliable, and if you have access to that, you can do increased uh, verification validation that way of the new algorithm. So um, that's something we can do more of as well. Yeah. I was asking kind of because there's a part of data that used to be used for positioning. A lot of efforts we put in, put into, you know, for example, accounting for the weird errors that occurred for that. And obviously, you have this idea that you've got this problem with uh, multiple vessels going to have the same identifiers, and you're trying to like disentangle those two things and wonder how that held up in the, you know, essentially the presence of error or so. Yeah, so that was the prime reason why we went with this technique is to disentangle those multiple vessels. Thank you. <clears throat> we have someone online. Yeah, Alexandra. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my question was about uh, maybe the ASCD model. Um, I was just curious if when you compute your ship track from the AIS position, um, does the model redirect track that goes ar like around land or like if there's two points that um, the shortest path goes across land, does your model redirect around? Uh, around it. Land masks are not considered the model. All right, thanks. But there are algorithms right, for land avoidance. And we developed some at DAO, but uh, you know, some of the standard softwares have them now. And, and you can think about it just uh, rigorously as short symmetry and avoid shallow waters and things. I don't know if we're going to be incorporating that in this particular project, but there are a lot of advances in doing that these days. Lee? Yeah, we have a question from Lee. One comment? Yeah, 
Uh, hi there. Uh, so I've got a couple questions for Matt about AISDB. Uh, so the tool looks really nice. I just uh, jumped on the website quickly to take a look at the uh, interface. Um, when I took a look at it, I saw there were two AIS stations that it seems to be showing data from right now. I'm not sure if that's just because I wasn't querying properly. Um, so is there more data that's currently live or is it just the two stations for the moment? Those two stations are Virgin's uh, AIS stations that we've deployed. In terms of uh, more data, we, we can't share all of our other data publicly. So right now, only data that we actually collect is available online. OK, I see. Uh, other question about the interpolation that you're using in this. So is that mostly just for kind of small gaps in tracks to make sure that you've got uniform frequency, or are you also looking at uh, larger gaps where it might not be understood so well what the vessel did during uh, kind of a big gap where transmissions are missing? So um, if there's a larger gap, what we typically do is we'll segment those tracks. Um, so if we're looking at, say, a month at a time, we might segment after 24 hours and 48 hours with no data. Uh, the interpolation is just to uh, normalize it for figures such as maps. OK, got it. Thanks. Oh, right. Who went first? Oh, you go ahead. OK. I just wanted to add that uh, we worked with uh, in that group when we were develop developing the database and for our applications. And I feel like there was, you know, there was a raw track processing, but then there was a lot that happened after, as you mentioned, in terms of data products and metrics that were useful and our sort of assessments of connectivity of coastal zones. So there is a lot of, I guess, direction from the end user on, in terms of what kind of next processing steps and products were uh, useful to us. So as you're doing sort of engaging this end user, so Tobias kind of mentioned that too, is everybody's going to have kind of different uses of the data products or the data outputs and things. And so it's important to kind of think about that because I think that's where we spent a lot of time too in our discussions and project work was really kind of thinking through how we would actually want to be using the data. And, you know, Matt kind of did that too, getting us there with the data processing. Thank you. Okay, my question is more for, I guess, Matt, Ron, and Claudio. It was kind of just discussed already the challenges around data governance and the ability to share AIS data because so many of the sources are commercial. They come with terms of terms and release conditions. Is there a piece of the AIS Viz or this AIS DB that's going to try and build a data governance layer to facilitate that so that you know when, when and where you have the authority to share without having to deal with everything on a case by case basis or people make a request and then someone has to review it and go through that whole data governance piece. I know I wear two hats, one I'm a PhD student at Dell, the other one I work for DRDC, working for D&D and the CAF, and it's the same problem we have every time when it's, you talk about BMS data, I, all the other collectors of data in maritime domains struggle with data sharing, even interdepartmental data sharing within government hard enough, let alone you know, to the academic institutions or industry partners that want to innovate with this data as well. I feel like that would be a really cool space to work in, especially in the computer science with a lot of people trying to use more rule-based data governance systems that can sit in the database or close to the database. So you just know based on who's requesting your rules and those rules get applied at like kind of a data level. Um, just throwing it out there, whether that's been discussed, it's trying to come up with ways to solve this data governance problem. So, so I'll just say that within DFO and um, Tobias and George can chime in. It really depends on the source of the data, right? So if you're talking about satellite data, we have a license with, right now it's Xactor, but it's been other providers in the past. And they basically dictate that, the use of that raw data. Um, in terms of sharing that with partners, we can definitely and have had data sharing agreements in the past for short term for collaborative projects. Um, the, the question really becomes, it's not about sharing the data because that's licensed. That's not gonna be an option typically from the providers. It's about what level of product production can you share. Yeah. And so sometimes products can be shared and you need to look at that very closely. I'm definitely not an expert. Within, with, if you switch that to terrestrial data, at least within our purview, where uh, we go to Coast Guard to get most mandate is to share data. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm not exactly sure where that fits in the Coast Guard mandate. Um, they're a little different sometimes. And I know people have had trouble accessing that data, including um, colleagues within DFO. But typically, you can go through the hoops and get access to that data. Well, and provide it. The VMS is probably the oldest system that DFO has. It goes back to the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and there are other issues on top of that, privacy, right? Because it really was designed to track phishing within the Canadian um, industry. And so people are very sensitive about sharing that data, likely because they feel like you can back out vessel information just by looking at characteristics. And certainly with AI, you probably can tell who's phishing, when and where, and where the most productive skull grounds are, et cetera, whatever. Um, that issue of sharing, that's probably been the toughest challenge, not because of the licensing issues, but because of that personal information aspect. So depending on where you're going for your data, you're going to get lots of separate challenges. Well, that's kind of where, uh, what I mean is pulling the, you know, the content of these terms and conditions, like the agreements and policy, algorithmically implementing them in a, a system that, so someone doesn't have to go back to read them and say, okay, what can I do? Not do. So that's kind of where we think there's a lot to make. We, we do know all the data stores that come with their own release condition experience of what you can do with it, what you can't do with it. So instead of everybody having to go back and read those to remember what they can or can't do sometimes. Right. I think the, I think defining those rules. So if I hold a license and big data center holds their own license to exact earth, can we share? Yeah. Um, are those like are those licenses the same? We have global data. Do they have global data? Or are they are they restricted in space and time? Um, I, one thing that I don't hear people talking about is sort of data that's been out there for ten years. At what point does that you lose ownership of that and does it become public record? Right, because a lot of the tracking infrastructure does not belong to one company as well either. So those issues have to be dealt with. Um, I think from our perspective, it, we hold broad temporal spatial coverage licenses. So we feel like anything that um, is produced here, we can use at least data for the same years and space. And we feel the coverage is good enough that we'll be able to implement um, those tools effectively. Um, and probably, and maybe even more broadly, depending on what your license restrictions are. But it's an, it's an issue. I think the collaborating with academics, collaborating with NGOs, with um, even smaller groups, whether it's First Nations consulting companies, um, is pretty nice. But where it also becomes an issue is when we're trying to decide exactly what kind of data we can serve to the public, where somebody wants to go on to some GUI that's been produced and look cottage front door and see what they're seeing, right? Where, where do the restrictions come in there? I'm definitely not an expert in that, but they're definitely going to come up. Mm -hmm. I'll add to that, Mark, because uh, as far as I know, uh, it's not a deliverable in this project, but because the whole aim is to try to make it more shareable, we will be considering as much as possible those issues as we progress both the academia and the government. Yeah.